Hello everyone, my name is Sandy Delgado. I'm a forecaster here at the National Hurricane Center in the uh, tropical and forecasting branch, TAFB. Uh, let's do some housekeeping items. The webinar is being recorded and at the end of the webinar, uh, we will basically uh, send you the recording uh, to your email. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, please log off and log back in and that usually does the trick. If you have any questions throughout the seminar, please, uh, we have a questions box, put them there and we will get to them at the end of uh, Chris's talk. And talking about Chris, today's seminar will be about the TASB, about TASB and its products. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Chris Lansing. He's the brand chief, uh, um, we're all the uh, forecaster, brand chief of TASB. Uh, Chris, take it away. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, my name is Chris Landsi, and you may think that can't be his real name, given that he's a marine forecaster working at the National Hurricane Center, uh, but I can assure you it is. And so uh, we've got a chance today to talk to you about the forecasts we provide for mariners that go out over the open ocean uh, in the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic, and the East Pacific. Um, and to paraphrase our mission statement there, uh, we provide uh, wind and wave analysis and predictions, as well as issue warnings uh, over the tropical and subtropical oceans uh, for the protection of life and property. And all those uh, acronyms down below um, show you that we are part of um, the National Hurricane Center. So it's our marine branch, tropical analysis and forecast branch. The National Hurricane Center is one of 10 national centers. Another one is the Ocean Prediction Center. That's our colleagues up at uh, College Park, Maryland that do the high latitudes of the Atlantic and the Pacific. We are all part of the National Weather Service. Uh, and the National Weather Service is within NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, and NOAA is in the Department of Commerce. So what does that mean? It means for those that are US citizens, when you pay your income tax, you are paying my salary, so thank you very much. That's uh, it's important for us to provide what we do. And what we do, all of our forecasts are available to anybody uh, free of charge, uh, US citizens or folks around the world. So with that preamble, who are our customers? Well, our customers um, are the Mariners and the Mets. Oh, wait a second, Sandy, I think you put that in there accidentally. Not these Mariners and Mets, these mariners and Mets. The Mets would be the Caribbean meteorologists. Each country in the Caribbean, Central America, South America has their own weather service. And so, uh, so we work closely with them to help they, them provide the best forecast for their citizens. The mariners are folks that sh are shown here. So giant cruise ships, uh, cargo ships, some of which are a quarter mile long nowadays, and they have thousand or more uh, trailer truckloads on, on board, uh, oil tankers, uh, folks with giant personal yachts or, or tourist boats going across the Caribbean, uh, the U.S. Navy, and especially the U.S. Coast Guard. All of these are our customers. And so we want to make sure that they're getting um, our forecasts and making the best decisions possible uh, for them as we get into the severe hurricane season. It's important also, I think, to point out how important um, maritime trade is, and you may not know this, but 80% of all the goods uh, sold local, uh, sold globally are carried by giant cargo ships across the ocean. And so we want to make sure that those uh, men and women that are going across the, uh, the oceans are, are staying safe. Uh, but it's important to point out how, uh, how critical um, trade is over the open ocean and how much of the U.S. Uh, economy is supported uh, by those that are in the marine industries. So we do our forecasts not only through the authority of the National Weather Service, but under also under the auspices of the International Maritime Organization. So the IMO is part of the United Nations, and you can see this map around the world showing all the global oceans there's a country responsible for providing free public forecasts no matter where you are in the world. So for example, 
if you're over uh, by uh, Southeast Asia, then, uh, then Japan is responsible for providing marine forecasts for, for you. Uh, closer to home, uh, the colored areas show where the United States National Weather Service provides marine forecasts. And it's really spl uh, split up by office. Uh, so along the U.S. coast, there's a fairly narrow ribbon. That's a 60-mile ribbon. And that's issued by the local forecast offices. That's true both on the Pacific coast as well as the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic coast. Um, further out, the blue coloration is by the Ocean Prediction Center. Uh, they have offshore zones in dark blue in their high seas for the uh, Pacific are shown in light blue. The Honolulu Forecast Office does the Central Pacific in purple. Uh, there is Alaska offices that do the uh, offshores for, uh, near Alaska. And on the Atlantic side, the Ocean Prediction Center does uh, the high latitudes of the Atlantic as well as um, their offshore zones a little closer. So what we do at the National Hurricane Center, Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch is shown in green. So this area in dark green is our offshore zones where, where we provide five-day detailed forecasts uh, and the same in the Pacific as well. And the light green is our high seas area. It kind of looks small from this perspective, but those two areas combined are 10 million square nautical miles. So it's a big chunk of ocean that we're responsible for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And there are lots of ships out there. Uh, indeed, you can go to a, a website called marinetraffic.com and it can show you what ships are out there every single day of the year. And uh, they're color coded. And so the red are oil tankers, uh, the green are cargo ships, the orange are fishing boats, uh, the blue are tugboat and special craft helping out with the oil platforms. The dark blue are uh, cruise, uh, cruise ships, um, and the purple are giant personal yachts. And so it's amazing how many hundreds and sometimes thousands of giant ships are out there in our waters every single day of the year, whether it's the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, the West Atlantic, uh, or the East Pacific, uh, especially going through the widened Panama Canal uh, lately. So what are some of the tools that we use on a daily basis to provide our marine forecasts? So we start first with the observations. Uh, so we have ships that are providing their information to us. Uh, we're very interested in knowing what their winds are, what their uh, wave heights are, uh, because they're experiencing those weather conditions. And if we don't, if, we, if they send us that information, that helps us out. We also have buoys over the open ocean that are anchored to the ocean floor, and they give us continuous wind and wave information all the time. In addition to those local measurements, uh, there's also remote sensed information from satellites. See these colored wind barbs are from a radar called a scatterometer. The US doesn't have any scatterometers, but the European Space Agency has two. And so we get uh, the output from those radars in space. And there's a separate radar called an altimeter that gives us wave height, and it's accurate to a nearest half foot. It's incredible how information we can get from space about both winds and waves. I do want to do a shout out to the Voluntary Observing Ship Program, the VOS program. So this is where mariners over the open ocean send their observations in. And in the past, it's been um, manual entry and sending it off. Uh, but we're working uh, in our VOS program to make more automated measurements so we can find out more. We only get measurements from right now about 5% of the ships out there. So the more reports we get from you as an, a Blue Water Mariner, the, the better we can do our job of analyzing what's going on now and making a good prediction in the future. Another key set of tools for us are the satellites both the geostationary satellites that watch the same patch of ocean and land all the time. And in the last uh, half dozen years, NASA has launched um, three brand new satellites. They're called GOES. And in unprecedented uh, detail and additional channels for us to watch uh, the, the weather unfold, uh, they have a lightning mapper on them. So it's incredible data that we're getting. NASA launches these. Uh, you pay for them as U.S. taxpayer. They're about a billion dollars each. And then NOAA runs them in a, a facility in Suitland, Maryland. There's also 
satellites that orbit the Earth uh, several times a day, and many of those have microwave imagery on them, but we can see through the thin upper level clouds, or what we call cirrus, and that's really helpful for diagnosing where is the, the low level spin to a developing tropical storm. Some other tools that we use are the different computer models. Because we have such a large domain, we focus on using global weather models, some of which are made by the United States, including the global forecast system. Um, some are made by the Brits. The uh, UK Met Office is an excellent model. Uh, the Europeans also have the European um, Medium Range Weather Forecast, or ECMWF. Uh, and so we blend those wind models together, as well as measurements, to come up with uh, an assessment of what's going on now, as well as our best forecast for the next five days. Then we do run a model internally. We have a wave model that we run that provides both wind waves that are generated by the way the winds locally, as well as swell event, where there may be some huge waves generated by winds and those move across the ocean and still stay fairly large. And so what we provide then is a consistent set of wind and wave forecast products for the mariners over the open ocean. So an example of how we do that, when our colleagues uh, across the hall in the hurricane specialist unit provide the five-day forecast, uh, we fill in the details. And so we are frantically working away as soon as they send out the advisory. And so this case from Hurricane Ida last year at about 30 hours uh, when Ida was approaching the, uh, the Louisiana coast, uh, that's what the hurricane specialist unit provided, and this is what we provided. So we're filling in the detail of the wind speed and direction, as you can see by the wind barbs, and the colors indicate the significant wave height. Uh, and so this is uh, an opportunity for us to flesh out those kind of details for folks that are um, on vessels or, or folks that are on the oil platforms as well to provide them the best wind and wave forecast possible. And we need to make sure it's consistent with what our colleagues are doing. We wouldn't want to say there's a three foot waves and yet there's 100 knots of wind. So it needs to be a consistent forecast. And, and that actually gets to be complex to make sure we, we uh, adhere to that consistency. Another aspect of our tools that we use is a set of workstations called the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System. It's a very powerful set of software and hardware that allows us to look at all the measurements, all the observations, all the imagery, put everything into a database we call the GFE or Graphical Forecast Editor, and then that database helps us provide the forecast. Uh, we wouldn't want to go to 50 different websites to do, to do our job. Uh, that just would not be feasible. So having everything in one, um, one uh, consolidated package really helps facilitate us providing the best meteorology and oceanography to the mariners. So let's look at some of the products that we issue on a daily basis here. So one of which is the Unified Surface Analysis. And this is a combined product by four different agencies. Uh, the, Folks that are lucky enough to work in Honolulu uh, at the Honolulu Forecast Office, they do the Central Pacific. The Ocean Prediction Center does the high latitudes of the Pacific and the Atlantic. The Weather Prediction Center does Canada and US, um, minus Florida. Apparently they don't think Florida is part of the United States. After you've lived here a little while, you realize there's some truth to that. And we do the tropics, the, uh, the, the Caribbean, the Gulf, the West Atlantic and the East Pacific. We also stitch it together to provide a coherent whole um, for what's going on. So it's important to do that as a starting point because as forecasters, you need to know what's going on now before you can provide a prediction going out into the future there. So I did wanna show you what is the weather map today? And so this was the weather map put together uh, by Aidan Mahoney, uh, one of our Pathways interns. And you can see, for example, zoom in a little bit, um, over the Atlantic, things are fairly quiet today, very quiet, nice and quiet. There's a couple of tropical waves, one there at 77 west, one at 43 west. There's a very low latitude intertropical convergence zone and a weak monsoon trough, very weak low near the Cabo Verde Islands. And then as usual, the giant Bermuda Azores High, uh, semi-permanent feature out there and helping to cause the trade winds to blow all year round across the Caribbean. 
So fairly quiet uh, in the Atlantic today. So that's a key foundational product. Is, and we issue this six times a day, uh, four times a day in collaboration with these three other offices. We also do a discussion called the Tropical Weather Discussion four times a day. We do one product for the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf, and another text product for the East Pacific. And this is our opportunity as forecasters to talk about what's happening now, but what do we expect over the next five days? And we do want to focus on the big events. And during the winter time, that could be gales uh, associated with extra tropical cyclones. It could be cold fronts. It could be gap wind events. But this time of year, it's mainly tropical storms and hurricanes. So we really want to focus on uh, what those systems may do and the impacts that they may cause. So when we do issue these uh, forecasts and analysis, everything comes out of our, our gridded database. And so uh, the grids of winds and waves and warnings um, help us to inform our text products, our graphics that are both um, radio fax based as well as internet based, and our gridded forecasts uh, that are available for folks that can ingest grids and visualize them. So this gridded database is part of the Weather Service wide national digital forecast database. And our component is uh, the, our area from 6 north to 30 north, from 35 west um, uh, to the United States and Central America. It's a 10 kilometer resolution, that's six nautical miles, and it uh, goes out through six days. And right now we're doing 10 meter winds and gusts, significant wave height and hazards, that is if any, any warnings that are in place. So how does one get forecasts over the open ocean? It really depends on A, where you're at, and B, what your technology is on your ship. Uh, if you're on a cruise ship, everybody on board has high-speed internet if they're paying for it, um, because the cruise lines are paying a lot of money for that kind of um, connections with satellites. But most vessels aren't as fortunate as cruise ships as far as connectivity. Uh, so there's still many ships over the open ocean, especially cargo ships and oil tankers, that may not have redundant high-speed internet on board. So there's a variety of ways to get forecast information. If you're within about 25 miles ashore, the NOAA weather radio, is pick, you can pick that up. Uh, you're further out, then we have a voice broadcast that's at high frequency uh, that's available over the entire Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Uh, there's also the uh, radio fax that we send out, uh, graphical information. There's a medium range transmitter that sends our, a text forecast called Navtex that's focused on the major US ports. There's also satellite-based information. So Inmarsat for many years had been a, a sole provider of satellite transmissions through the Global Marine Distress and Safety System, which was formed after the Titanic uh, disaster uh, over 100 years ago. And uh, so through satellite, the, all vessels over a certain size are required to have access to it. Uh, now there is a, a, a competitor coming on to the uh, uh, coming available called Iridium. Um, and we aren't quite transmitting our high seas forecast yet, but we're getting close to being able to do so soon. Another way to get forecast information, and this is one often used by the sailboat community, uh, is FTP mail. So if you can receive any kind of email um, um, over the open ocean, you can request either a text product or graphical product uh, through one-time use there. And then lastly, one that we're trying to focus more on is as the internet becomes more available over the open ocean is our marine composite page. And I'll show you how to use that uh, going forward here. So let's talk about some of these products here today. Uh, so the high seas, this is the one mandated by the global marine distress and safety system. We do this four times a day and we really focus on the big stuff. So winds 25 knots or greater, seas at least eight feet, um, certainly something that would get the attention of a, a of a, of a personal yacht, but for cargo ships uh, and oil tankers, that probably doesn't get their attention very much. Uh, we do issue this um, four times a day, one for the Atlantic Basin, one for the Pacific Basin, and, uh, and, it, and, it, and it goes out through 48 hours. Um, let's go to the next one. The next are our offshore zones, and so this is more detailed information. Um, and we just recently revamped it so that uh, we've increased the number of zones by 50%. Uh, 
and uh, and filled in this kind of a uh, uh, little uh, empty patch between uh, Bermuda and the Lesser Antilles. And so now we've uh, expanded our, our marine zones as of April. And the idea is to provide in 12 hour increments what the wind and waves are expected to be, uh, as well as uh, informing the mariner for any uh, warnings that are in place, whether it's winter gale storm events um, or this time of year, tropical storm or hurricane events. We do the same for the uh, East Pacific offshore zones, in particular that shipping line that goes from Southern California uh, past Mexico and Central America into the Panama Canal and over to the Galapagos Islands. Uh, I did want to just show this because it's uh, we do have a nice GUI that one can interface to pull up the forecast. So basically you hover over and it provides the, the latest forecast uh, that one can take a look at there. Bring it down so it can be seen. So this would be the one just uh, uh, offshore of Guatemala and El Salvador that was issued earlier today by uh, forecaster Jeff Lewitsky. So moving to another product, this is the Navtex. And uh, this is uh, available through a medium range receiver. Uh, it's transmitted by the Coast Guard. And you can see it's got a focus on the uh, US ports um, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and in the Caribbean. There's also this high frequency voice broadcast uh, that is available uh, for much of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, where it's uh, information similar to our offshore zones, but a little bit, uh, a bit, a little bit slimmed down to um, enable it to be broadcast by a voice broadcast. We are very fortunate for a partnership with the U.S. Coast Guard. They maintain these transmitters, both the medium-range transmitters, the high-frequency and very high-frequency transmitters. They have one in New Orleans, one in California, and one in Hawaii. And so, for many, many years, this is how Mariners has have gotten their, their forecast products is through uh, voice or nav text, text uh, or, or radio fax graphics. So some of the products that we produce routinely, um, both available on our website as well as uh, by radio fax. So the first of which is what's gonna happen for the next three days. So we have a day one, we have a day two and a day three forecast. This is what we call a surface prog where we Put on the map where there's any tropical storms or hurricanes, or in this case, where there's any cold fronts, as well as the, the pressure pattern that, that also matches that. So let's take a quick look at what's forecast uh, three days from now. And so this was put together by uh, Aiden Mahoney and, and Gladys Rubio today. So three days from now, uh, we'd be looking at Monday. Forecasts are fairly benign, very quiet. No gales, no tropical storms. Let's keep it that way. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, it's not going to last, though. So that's one of the set of products, our surface progs. The next is switch to waves. So we have a product called a sea state analysis. So what are the waves out over the open ocean? And what is the dominant wave or swell direction? Which way are the waves coming from? And so this is done twice a day. And again, one product for the Atlantic uh, and one product for the Pacific. Uh, wind wave charts. So we do these again for day one, day two, day three. The wind barb shows the wind speed and direction, and the number shows the significant wave height. Uh, so let's take a look at what's being forecast for Monday over the Caribbean, the Gulf, and the Atlantic. Uh, fairly weak winds. Uh, we're looking at moderate to fresh winds. So that's 15 to 20 knots over the Caribbean. Fairly quiet. Uh, and peak seas of only eight feet uh, near the, uh, uh, the greater Antilles in Puerto Rico. So fairly quiet conditions uh, for late July at this point. Again, that was by uh, Gladys Rubio earlier today. And then finally, we have an automated product uh, that show the wave periodicity and direction. So what way is the wind uh, waves coming from and what is the period? That is how often do the waves hit? And so if there's wind waves and they, they are occurring every, say, six to 10 seconds, they're in blue. If they're a uh, very long period swell, um, in this case, coming all the way across from the Southern hemisphere, across the equator and reaching Central America, we would have a 15 to 20 second period. So very long period swell. 
So I did want to talk a little bit about specifically hurricanes. Uh, Mike Brennan did an excellent job yesterday of going through some of the hurricane specialist unit products. Uh, there has been a tool that the Mariners have used in the past. It's been taught for many years called the one, two, three rule, where you basically take the cone and you look at the forecast size and you draw a circle around it. And that was the one, two, three rule to avoid that. Well, we're trying to retire it. It was useful during its time, but we have a more sophisticated, more direct way of knowing where the danger area is from tropical storms and hurricanes. And it stems back from what the hurricane specialists are doing every six hours. So as Mike described yesterday, there is a product called the wind speed probabilities that's based on the official forecast. And then there's a thousand member mathematical technique called a Monte Carlo approach we have a thousand hypothetical little hurricanes, all having plausible tracks, plausible peak winds, and plausible sizes. And essentially, we count up from all those thousand members how often different wind thresholds are met, whether it's tropical storm winds, 34 knots, 50 knots, or hurricane force winds, 64 knots. And so that allows us to say, what is your chance, what is your likelihood of those different winds? So we do have a product that's on our website as well as sent out by Radiofax that is a tropical cyclone danger graphic. The way we have it is that if you just want to know where it's most likely to have those tropical storm force winds, it's the dark hatch. So that's at least 50% chance of tropical storm force winds. But maybe you want to be very risk averse. Maybe you're on a cruise ship and you really want to make darn sure you avoid those tropical storm force winds because unlike a, uh, an oil tanker, a cruise ship has cargo that tweet. You don't want them tweeting bad things. In this case, you want to be very risk averse and, and really make sure you avoid those tropical storm force winds. So then you use the 5% for the light hatching and stay out of that area to make darn sure that you don't go in those. Um, we can take a quick look at what it says today, but I can guarantee you it says there's nothing going on. Um, so no tropical cyclone activity today, um, which is good news. So those are the products that I wanted to discuss with you, um, but I did want to have a question for you. And I really like to get your feedback as a mariner over the open ocean. So if you go out over the, the deep water, what I, what I call a blue water mariner, I'd love for you to answer this question because we need to know how you are getting your weather forecasts. And in particular, we want to know when you're over the open ocean, how often do you use radio facts to view the unified surface analysis, the sea states, the wind waves, and the surface fogs, any of our products. And that would also be true for the Ocean Prediction Center. Do you use them daily over the open ocean? Do you use them occasionally? Do you use them rarely, like as a backup capability, or do you use them never? Um, and if you go over the open ocean and you don't use them because you don't even know about them, please say never, because that's important to know. So uh, Sandy just opened up the poll. Sandy, did you want to explain how to do it? Yes, already 30%, 32% of the participants, the attendees have already voted. And exactly as you, uh, so you explained, basically, you click on uh, in case you haven't that you have used this daily just cl click on daily and that uh, circle right next to it and or occasionally rarely or never okay right well, now we'll come we back to that so if you need time to think about it but please please uh, let us know because this is important for us to understand how right are now we're now 46 percent uh chris the thing is that if i closer then they cannot vote oh okay all right, well, let's give people 30 more seconds to vote. Okay. So, so one thing that we, while people are voting, one thing we wanna make sure is that we're staying relevant and in providing information um, and accessibility to the forecast. And so if folks are using radio facts, that's great, we'll still keep providing it. But if it turns out that, that it's not being used anymore, we need to know that. And so this is one informal way we can ask actual mariners of, of how much use they're getting out of, in this case, the high frequency radio transmissions by the US Coast Guard um, to view graphical products, our, our, our products and the Ocean Prediction Center products, and also the Honolulu Forecast Office. They do some graphical marine products as well. 
All right, so 10 more seconds to vote. And I appreciate it. Thank you for this feedback. All right, we'll go to the next one and then we'll come back to the results at the end here. Um, so one way that we're trying to encourage mariners to uh, use our information if they have some internet, and I was just chatting today with some folks in the British Navy where they have some internet on, some, on one of their ships, but not a lot. So this is a good way to get it. It's called our Marine Composite page. Uh, and I'll show you the website, actually you see the website there. And so on the right side, it has for a cold front that came out of uh, Southeast United States two winters ago. And the wind barbs show the wind speed and direction. And the colors indicate significant wave height. In this case, we got significant wave heights all the way up to about 25 feet or about eight meters. On the left side, it shows a graphical representation of one of our text products. So our high seas text product, anything more than eight feet shows up as blue. Anything at least 23 knots shows up as orange. Anything that's both as the hatched. And anything that's red is gale, gale, uh, gale, gale force. And on top of that, it shows these uh, forecaster drawn features that, that match that. So this was a strong cold front coming out that had gales both ahead and behind of the front. Um, so to me, I could interpret this in about one minute as opposed to trying to read through our, our, our high seas text forecast that, that is difficult to read. Um, and, uh, and folks want more graphics and less text. So let's open that up and just show you how to use it. Um, so it's this graphical interface and you select what you want to look at. So let's say I want to look at um, 10 meter winds. Uh, but you can choose 30 meter winds or 50 meter winds. That's about 100 feet above the ocean, 160 feet above the ocean. So if you're on a ship that's very tall above the water, you may want to choose the other winds. And let's look at um, wave heights in, in meters. And let's look at what the forecasters put on here. So this shows the analysis from 12 uh, Z time or Greenwich um, Meridian time. And so uh, we go forward in time. So this button up here allows you to go, uh, this is for tomorrow morning and conditions haven't changed too much. The peak winds are only about 20 knots, maybe 25 knots near Columbia. And the light blue indicates significant wave heights of only two to three meters, um, about uh, eight to nine feet. Uh, we can go to Sunday morning, conditions haven't changed too much. There's a weak trough, a little bit stronger winds behind the trough a couple of weak uh, tropical waves, but not much. Go forward again uh, to, uh, this would be uh, Monday morning at this point, and uh, conditions about the same. That weak trough is reaching the, the Bahamas, uh, but really no development into a tropical storm or hurricane. Uh, days four and days five, we can show our forecast, but we don't have any corresponding features at this point. We may in the future though. So I hope that's uh, one way you can take a look at graphically our forecast that we issue um, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So I did want to talk a little bit about um, impacts. And unfortunately, there have been some ships and uh, captain and crew that have gotten themselves into really big trouble, uh, mainly with hurricanes over the last couple of decades. Uh, whether it was the, uh, the tourist sailboat, the Phantom, that sank in the Northwest Caribbean, uh, no tourists on board, but all 31 uh, crew members perished in Hurricane Mitch. Uh, was a, the recreated uh, HMS Bounty um, in 2012 when it sank off in North Carolina, uh, where the captain and one of the crew members uh, perished. Or whether it was just three years ago, the Bourbon Road, which is a Luxembourg flagged transoceanic tug, that went right into the middle of Hurricane Lorenzo and uh, 11 of 14 crew members perished. And the most infamous uh, lately has been the US flagged El Faro, which was going every week between Jacksonville and San Juan, Puerto Rico. And it was taking cars from Jacksonville to San Juan uh, when the captain um, took the, this vessel, a thousand foot long cargo ship, a roll on, roll off uh, vessel, right into the middle of Hurricane Joaquin when Joaquin was a category four hurricane. Um, and the Coast Guard and the National Transportation Safety Board did a forensic investigation of what happened. Uh, they were able to get the uh, voice recorder 
that was attached to the uh, to the ship, and they were able to recreate what happened. And while the forecasts weren't perfect, uh, they never are perfect. Uh, the forecasts were certainly sufficient to, to let the captain and crew know that there was a dangerous hurricane that they were going into. Um, but the captain decided to go into the hurricane, and the no one shore side was paying attention. Um, and so, unfortunately, all 33 people on board perished in this hurricane. Fortunately, there's been a lot of changes made, I think, in the industry to safeguard a bit from that, allowing the crew to have more say in uh, what the captain is doing and having the shoreside operators paying more attention to where their giant vessels are going. It's a good thing. And the other good thing is this is pretty rare. Nowadays, when we're watching what's going on, and we can actually see the giant vessels through this marinetraffic.com website. And so this is a set of screen captures I did from two years ago when Hurricane Delta was approaching and then hitting Louisiana. And we could see the ships adjusting their location and their route accordingly. Um, so as the hurricane got off the Yucatan of Mexico and started heading northwestward, we could see the ships moving and getting out of the way. Almost all of them were doing the right thing. There was a couple that were getting themselves into trouble. But in general, you can see that all these hundreds of ships, they're hearing about the forecast, they're changing their route accordingly to stay out of the high winds and mountainous seas. And so even at this point here, day before landfall, look at all those red oil tankers nestled up against uh, Corpus Christi and, and, and Houston Galveston. They're staying out of the way. Uh, that got a little close, but uh, in general, most of the vessels uh, did, did the right thing and uh, practice correct hazardous weather avoidance. And then after the hurricane went through, the U.S. Coast Guard, along with NOAA and local officials, assess the ports and make sure they're safe for, for vessels to go in and out of, and then we can resume uh, normal operations. Because as I talked about at the beginning, the um, the port, the the marine traffic is incredibly important for U.S. as well as global commerce. 80% of global commerce is done on ships today. So I did mention the Coast Guard a couple of times, and we have a special relationship with them. Uh, you may be surprised to know that unlike the Air Force that has a lot of forecasters, unlike the U.S. Navy that has a lot of forecasters, the U.S. Coast Guard has zero forecasters. And so by design, Every 10 years, we sign a national level memorandum of agreement between the Coast Guard and the National Weather Service. And so we in the Weather Service provide them the forecast they need to do their job, as well as any briefing support or, or special predictions. And in return, they help broadcast our information to the mariners over the open ocean. And so it's a, it's a great partnership with, that we have. We've really tried to, um, accelerate our assistance to the Coast Guard. And because of our national level responsibilities, we work with the Coast Guard at their district level. And so, for example, District 7 here in Miami, District 8 in New Orleans, uh, District 11 in California, and District 14 in Hawaii. And so, when there's an issue over the open ocean, whether it's a man overboard, whether it's a missing ship or disabled ship, whether it's an aircraft that may have crashed over the open ocean. It could be an oil spill, or it could be law enforcement activities where the Coast Guard's going after the bad guys. We don't even need to know why they need a forecast. They just tell us, yes, we need a spot forecast, and we will let them know uh, what the conditions are in a very timely manner. We were doing forecasts today for the uh, Southeast Gulf of Mexico because there was a, a sailing vessel that was uh, issuing a, a distress call. And so we're, uh, District 7 asked for some assistance and we provide that, those forecasts to them. Additionally, during the hurricane season in particular, the Coast Guard has to make some difficult decisions. The biggest of which is the ports. Do they keep the ports open or do they close the ports when a hurricane's coming? When do they close the ports? These ports are big economic engines, so you don't want to close the ports unnecessarily. It's not our job as meteorologists to be the captain of the port. That's what the Coast Guard does. But we help, help them make those tough decisions. They also have to 
make their own decisions for their assets because most of the Coast Guard offices are right on the coast. Do they do business as usual and keep their office open or do they board up and leave? Um, and then finally, they have to, to get ready for some of the big hurricanes where they may be doing search and rescue. So they'll pre-position their cutters on the periphery of the hurricane, getting their helicopters and fixed wing aircraft ready to go rescue people if it's a big disaster. And so last year we did 44 of these live briefings, half for District 7 in Miami and half for D8 in New Orleans there. And our biggie was Hurricane Ida last year. Uh, we provided nine live briefings, uh, the first of which to District 8 in New Orleans was before there was a, any official um, hurricane advisory. Um, but we had proactively issued a gale warning um, in, 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 in advance of the tropical products. And when we did that first briefing and told them we're looking at a real big event for the North and Gulf Coast, perhaps Louisiana or Texas, they started uh, preparing. And uh, up upper left is an example of what they tweeted out in their preparations for Ida. And the bottom left is what they did afterwards to identify you know, our, what areas were impacted and, and do people need to be rescued. And so the quote from Captain uh, Harper Phillips uh, express his appreciation for what we've provided. So I did want to also highlight the uh, Weather Radiation Ambassador. Um, so this is a program to help the United States citizens and businesses get ready for impactful weather. And recently we started a Marine Ambassador component to that. And so we're encouraging companies to uh, sign up for the Weather Ready Nation. Uh, we provide additional educational resources and training um, and this is an opportunity to make sure that your business or your shipping line uh, is safe. And, uh, and so we, we want you to make the best decisions possible um, by providing you the forecast, how to get the forecast in, in, uh, in programs like this, um, and also the opportunity for us to interact with you. Lastly, I did want to point out our social media presence. Uh, we now tweet whenever we issue a warning over the open ocean. So we wanna make sure that the Mariners, if they're using social media, uh, that's one way we can get the uh, information out immediately. Uh, we also do um, tweets about big events uh, or the weather event of the day. Uh, and when it's real quiet, like today, we may be doing more of an educational tweet to get the, the word out. So our, our Twitter handle is uh, NHC underscore TAFB. And then lastly, uh, we've been trying to get our forecasters aboard vessels lately. And uh, we got uh, Dr. Nelsie Ramos, uh, one of our forecasters aboard the NOAA ship, the Ron Brown, um, in May 2019. We had to take a pause for the pandemic. And we recently got uh, Scott Stripling, one of our lead forecasters aboard the NOAA ship, the Nancy Foster. So this allows us as marine forecasters to really see, well, what does eight feet mean for a significant wave height? Because most of us, have never spent much time out over the open ocean. So we appreciate our NOAA colleagues allowing us to get aboard the NOAA ships and, and experience uh, life over the open ocean. So that, I think that wraps it up uh, from the 18 men and women here that work at the Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. Uh, we're here to, to keep the, keep you, help keep you safe. Uh, you as captain and crew have to make the right decisions, but we wanna provide the best forecast possible. Um, and I would invite you, you could even call us if you're out over the open ocean and you have a question. Uh, we don't do ship routing. That's that's the purview of the private sector, uh, but we're happy to answer questions. Um, and we also have um, our website there. You go to hurricanes um, and uh, slash marine, and that takes you right to it. So I think I'll stop there. And um, Sandy, if you could bring up the, uh, the, the, uh, the highlights for the, the, the uh, poll. Uh, and then we can chat about that briefly. Hey, Chris, uh, do you see the the results? I don't. Um, let's see, how do so, I bring those up? Uh, daily, 23%. Uh, occasionally, 13%. Uh, rarely, 19%. And never, 45%. Uh, wow. Okay. And how many respondents uh, provided that? 55%. Uh, Wow, that's great. The, at, that's great. 50, attendees of 55 percent. That's that's good to know. I'm glad. I I'm a little surprised that there's that many still using it, but that's that's what we need to know. Uh, so if if that's true general for Blue Water Mariners, that's a lot of people that are still using Radio Facts on a 
on a regular basis. And so, uh, so that's, that's very informative. You know, I think in a generation we'll move to uh, high-speed redundant internet access over the open ocean, uh, but we're clearly not there yet. So, uh, so that's that's informative. So I, I I ask that every chance I can for real mariners to uh, to let us know how do you get weather forecasts. So thank you for sharing, everybody. Uh, questions? Do you guys have any questions for us? Chris, so far I have uh, we oh we're now just getting questions. So. Okay. Uh, we have some comments from uh, David uh, Jones. He's saying that uh, rate of fax is most of uh, cost effective method available. Uh, and he's hoping for Starlink to become um, uh, more uh, become available offshore to have uh, internet access because right now it's only 12 miles uh, off the coast. Uh, we also just got a question. Um, I'm a blue water a recreational sailor. I have decades of cruising experience on my 34 foot uh, sailboat, uh, doing long ocean voyage, uh, passages. I have received your data over HAM S and SSB and other ways over the years. I really appreciate the job you do. Thank you. Oh, well, that's gratifying to hear. We, 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 we don't often hear directly from mariners, so, so getting that information is really wonderful. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, Chris, uh, I will, I will, oh, we just got another question. So, uh, when does the heart of the hurricane, uh, 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 basically Atlantic hurricane season 2022 start starting up? Uh, what's, what's going on this year with hurricane forecast? Right. So the anticipation by all the forecasting groups that do seasonal outlooks, including NOAA, is it's going to be very likely to be a, a busy year. Not a guarantee, but very likely. And for mariners, uh, you know, it's busy even if the, all the, sh the, the storms stay over, over the open ocean uh, because mariners have to make decisions to, to get out of harm's way. Now, it's not a guarantee it's going to be busy, um, but you might say, well, we're already two months into the hurricane season and we've only had storms for a couple of days. That, that, that sounds quiet. And the, the realization is that 90% of the major hurricanes occur just in August, September, and October. And, and a good 50% of the activity is in, in 50 days uh, from 20th of August till the 10th of October. So it's a really sharp annual cycle. And so it's going to be busy, very likely, um, sometime in August. And it may stay busy for, for weeks at a time. Um, so having it quiet now, that's not a surprise. It's uh, this time of year, it's not typical to have long-lived hurricanes out there. So, so our, the anticipation for it to be a busy year has not changed. It's still expected to be a very busy hurricane season. Oh, great, thank you. He's, Sandy's brought up the uh, climatology there. Why, why don't you speak on that? Yeah, it's, that's a question that we get uh, often. I have seen in social media a lot, and even uh, Tallahassee Weather Office addressed that recently in a tweet. Uh, and it's interesting. as. As you can see, we're basically at this time of the year, uh, basically just a couple a week or so before August uh, 1st. And the peak of the hurricane season, or the bulk of the hurricane season, basically is during the months of, of August, September, and October, as you can see uh, in this uh, over the last 100 years. So, and when it comes to, uh, so these days in Pacific, and especially when it comes to what it is hurricanes, and especially major hurricanes. So. A lot of times early in the season, we see uh, storms that develop off the East Coast and the Gulf of Mexico, sometimes in the Western Caribbean Sea, and those tend to be relatively weak. The threat is still there when it comes to, uh, to rainfall, and they can st uh, still do a lot of damage, as we saw with, uh, 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 with Alex and his uh, disturbance pr previously. And we also saw with Bonnie in Nicaragua, the Casa and, and Costa Rica, that led to a couple of deaths. So I'm not taking anything away from tropical storms. But when we think about uh, the hurricane season, we usually think about the Ida's that we saw last year, or uh, Andrew in 92, or, or Katrina's. And those tend to be later in the, in the year. It is interesting to mention, and this is another good, uh, good uh, uh, statistic. And as you can see, uh, when it comes to the name of name storms for the season, 
uh, they usually the first one uh, develops around June 20th, and then the second one around July 17th. We're already at number uh, three. We already have had Colin. So we're already basically uh, in this territory. So the season is, uh, you know, is going along, expected to be active. And at the end of the day, we will have to be ready. doesn't matter if it is an active or it's an inactive year, because we don't know the exact track that the hurricanes are going to take, uh, the storms are going to take. Um, we have another question, uh, Chris, um, unless you want to say something more about the hurricane season. Let's hear the question. Uh, it says, in relation to the question, uh, to, I mean to the poll, uh, I will say never, but I use the commercial predict wind. How do you, how do your products fit in, fit, fit in fit in with predict wind or another another one, windy? So I've, I've heard of both of those private vendors, but I don't know specifically what they provide in output. Um, I, I believe that some show raw model output, whether it's the global forecast system or the GFS wave for the wave predictions or the same from the ECMWF. Um, so I, I would hope that those private vendors also show our gridded forecasts because um, it's the same format as the model output, uh, but I don't know if they are. That would be something you can ask that private vendor. Are you showing the official National Weather Service grids uh, to access? And so uh, I think we need to follow up with the private vendors to encourage them to, to show the Weather Service grids so that folks can access them over the open ocean as well. Uh, we just got a comment to, to that question. It says, Windy use, when uses all, all you just mentioned, I believe predict wind or does also. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question it says, other than hurricane numbers, uh, is there an analysis for where they will be? Mm, because that's the good question. <laughs> right, and so the seasonal outlook has some skill at talking about overall activity. Um, and the problem, though, is that the seasonal outlook does not know where the preferred areas of formation are going to be. And the seasonal outlook does not know about the preferred steering pattern. And so without knowing where they form and the steering in advance, you have no idea about the impacts at any local area. So, so that's some of the limitation of the seasonal outlook. Yes, we can have some confidence going to be busy overall. But no, we don't know what areas are going to be impacted. And so bottom line is, if you're in an area that has been hit by hurricanes before, you need to be ready to be uh, hit this year. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and don't don't play the odds that you're not going to get. And most years you don't get hit, even in a place like Miami. Um, but uh, we do know that that, uh, that living in, in uh, the tropical areas is a place that you get hit once in a while. So you have to be ready every year. Yeah, that's what's interesting to us. I'm showing here in the screen, this is uh, 2010. So not every active year is, is the same. Not every inactive year is the same. Uh, you have inactive, in quotes, inactive uh, years like 92 and you had Hurricane Andrew or 83 and you had Hurricane Alicia that hit uh, as a major hurricane in Houston. And then you had active years like 2010, as we're seeing here in this graphic. And you can see all the hurricanes that developed that, that year, 19 named tropical cyclones. However, the major hurricanes, as you can see here, all the major hurricanes uh, stay over the water. Yes, we had a lot of landfalls over uh, Central America and Mexico, unfortunately, and even in the Caribbean, but the major hurricanes stayed over the water. Now we changed that to, famously or infamously 2005 and then we have this situation where all the major hurricanes were basically farther west their tracks were farther west so even when we say active year we don't we can't predict exactly where they're going to form and who is going to be affected so that's why we always have to be ready uh chris uh we have other uh questions it says well, wh when we can expect a quiz quit scat Quitsat uh, uh, satellite to cover the entire Atlantic basin, so we can ha we have no gaps in data. 
Right. So, so right now the scatterometers that are out there, um, the Europeans have two, and they're going to be launching another one in the near future. Uh, and those are good. Uh, they do have limitations of resolution, and it's hard for them to see the inner core of a hurricane very well. And uh, right now the United States has no scatterometers. And so we rely on the good nature of the European Space Agency for providing uh, that information to us. Um, that would be something that would be great to have a, uh, an advanced scatterometer um, that's been talked about before, but it's, it's not something that's been funded um, by US agencies to, to put together. Um, but we, we, do, we, have, we are limited in knowing what the strongest winds are over the open ocean, especially when their aircraft reconnaissance is not inside the storm. Yeah, for those that are not aware of what uh, quick scout or scatterometer, so scatterometer wind data is, here is, uh, and why we have some, this gaps, here's how there is presented. Basically, you have the, if you click on it, you can see the winds uh, at the surface or the, uh, or the ocean. And they're extremely useful because a lot of times we don't have a lot of data over the open ocean. So um, another question that we have, Chris, is uh, how does uh, this La Nina play with the hurricane, Atlantic hurricane season uh, with quit now? I'm not sure what. So, yeah, so the uh, one of the main factors for the seasonal outlook is the presence of either an El Nino or a La Nina. And so uh, El Nino is where you're getting warmer than normal water on the eastern equatorial uh, Pacific. And La Nina is colder than normal water. And uh, one of the main effects of El Nino during August, September, and October is it causes more wind shear that tears apart the storms in the Caribbean and the tropical Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so we have the opposite this year. We have La Nina, and it, it appears that it's going to stick around during August, September, and October. And that would be one reason to uh, enhance the hurricane season because it has less of the shear and hurricanes can, can stay more vertical and get stronger. Uh, and so that's, that's, a, that's a key part. And, and this would be the third year in a row of a La Nina, uh, which is unusual, uh, but it's happened uh, a couple times before. Uh, now we have three minutes left, so I will ask a final question. If we have more, if you have more questions, please type them in, and we will get them uh, right back uh, to your email. The answer um, says uh, Chris. Yesterday I asked about the seasonal forecast and number of storm predictions. We discussed the most the most storms are in August to October, with earlier parts of the season less active. Will it make sense to predict number of storms per month of each hurricane season to improve the overall accuracy of predictions? So the month to month forecast has been pursued to, to some degree. Uh, I know that uh, Phil Klotzbach has done some work on that and it's, it's quite difficult uh, because you have a phenomenon called the Madden-Julian oscillation and that causes a, a, a seesaw or flip in conditions on a about a four to eight week time scale. And uh, sometimes that Madden-Julian oscillation or MJO is strong and, and it's regular and it makes it predictable. And other times it's not. Um, so that, that kind of not very uh, predictable forecast skill makes it difficult. But also it, it only affects the low latitude storms. Storms that form in the subtropics it really uh, doesn't play much of a role. And so, so yes, that would be nice if one could do um, the seasonal outlook by month by month, um, but it turns out it's actually more difficult uh, than to do that than the season as a whole um, because of the inability to recreate the MJO and then how it's gonna behave over the next several weeks. Okay. Perfect timing. We basically had left, less than a minute to go. Chris, do you have anything else that you want to say? Uh, maybe talk a little bit about future uh, products or anything that we're working on to have available in the near future. I, I think we'll we'll stop there, but uh, appreciate everybody's time today and uh, stay safe over the open oceans. And, and like I said, make sure you're consulting the forecast as you uh, decide your ship route. You want to stay safe and, and keep your cargo safe too.
Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you for coming.